looking so happy about, Linda? Hello, everybody. We're going to find out why Linda looks so happy. <laughs> uh, this is Nanette with uh, Humanities Team and the Evolution Revolution, and we are on Chapter 21. And we are going to get started here with Linda's help, and uh, we're with The Storm Before the Calm by Neil Donald Walsh. Go oh, take it away, Linda. Okay, so we're on page 159. That puts us 59% of the way through this book. Um, conversation 21. Can you believe what we could believe if we simply chose to? I recognize that it took a bit of pluck, a bit of fortitude to look closely at all of that. There's probably a bit of underbelly in there for all of us, someplace where we feel particularly vulnerable. After all, a lot of this stuff was taught to us by some of the most venerable persons in our lives, parents, grandparents, relatives, favorite teachers, the gray-haired, soft-spoken priest, the wonderful humorous minister, the wise and worldly rabbi. But now the time for courage has really come. Now comes the part that some people of power don't want you to read because they know you'll get all excited about it, and that'll be the beginning of the end of their game. Now come some specific ideas that might form the basis for a first draft of humanity's new human story. Chief among them is the idea that God and life are one, that everything in life is part of a unified whole, and that our different belief systems are merely wonderfully divergent paths to, some, to the same destination, a destination the soul need not strain to reach because it is already there, the everlasting embrace of God. The doctrine of oneness used as a basis for all human political, economic, social, educational, and religious decisions is the foundation of the new cultural story I am proposing. Should we share this idea with enough people to create critical mass? Should we succeed in shifting the resonant field? We can breathtakingly alter life as it is lived on earth. What kinds of changes might humanity see? What kinds of shifts could occur in your personal life? Back just a little bit ago, I offered you a narrative, roll up, a rollout of that. It was a broad, general narrative. Now, have a category-by-category category look at what I believe will happen. Here is one vision of what humanity's new cultural story could place into our day-to-day -day experience. Regarding God, humans will understand that Allah, Brahman, Elohim, Elohim, God, Jehovah, Krishna, and Yehovah are among the many names humans have chosen, ha, humans have given to the one thing that is. They'll also understand that the one thing that is, is all that exists. There is nothing that is not part of the one thing that is. The only thing that is the superior being the creator of heaven on earth and earth, the giver of life, omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipresent, wise and beyond human understanding. Oneness used as a basis for all human decisions is the foundation of the new cultural story. The only thing that is, is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end, the unmoved mover, not separate from humanity, but one with it, not separate from life, but one with it, both the creator and the created, with the created necessarily then being in the image of the only thing that is. The only thing that is wants and needs nothing. How could it? It's the only thing that is. 
It does not, therefore, sit in judgment of anyone, nor decide at some sort of reckoning whether a part of itself will be able to rejoin the whole of itself since no part has ever separated from the whole and could not be. One result of this new teaching, no human beings will be afraid of God or Allah or Yehwah or whatever name they choose to give the all in all. They'll simply love God completely and utterly as the amazing amalgam that God is. Humans will also no longer confuse love and fear. They'll see clearly that these are mutually exclusive, that they cannot both exist at the same time in the same place. The effort to pretend they can, that they somehow go together, is what has turned many humans into neurotic beings, trying to live out a reality that is completely out of alignment with what they instinctively know to be so, and completely contrary to their nature. Regarding God's word and God's messenger, humans will understand that God's words are found in all of the world's holy scriptures, and that no scripture is more authoritative, more complete, more accurate, or more authentic than any other, but that each contains great wisdom and each leads to a greater understanding of the only truth there is. So too will humans understand that there are many messengers of the only truth there is. Indeed, that all people everywhere are messengers and that their message is their life lived. For life is a process by which life is informed about life through the expression of life itself. Life tells life about life through life. Humanity is what it shows itself to be. Every human being is both the messenger and the message. One result of this new teaching, human beings will stop trying to figure out which is the right text and which is the right messenger and will simply look closely to see which text And which messenger speaks to them in a way that makes it possible for them to understand the great mysteries and the great wonders of life. Human beings, humans will also stop trying to convince others that the messenger and the text that has touched their heart is the only one that people should turn to. Wars and killing in the name of a particular text or messenger will be impossible to justify under these circumstances and will all but disappear. Heaven and hell. Regarding heaven and hell, humans will understand that the universe is not some outlying territory separate from heaven, but that it's part of the only territory there is. They'll come to understand that heaven is the experience of traveling through that territory in a state of bliss, a state that may be reached at any time, no matter where within the territory of life one happens to be. Humans will also understand that life is not a symptom of reward and punishment and that no one is sent to hell or condemned by God. At least one major religious leader, Pope John Paul II, has already clarified this. He made a theologically breathtaking statement before a papal audience in Rome on July 28, 1999. Quote, Damnation cannot be attributed to an initiative of God, because in his merciful love, He cannot want anything but the salvation of the beings he created, the Pope declared to an astonished world. Eternal damnation is never the initiative of God. It's the self-imposed punishment of those who choose to refuse God's love and mercy, the pontiff added. 
And what is this damnation that is referred to? Is it endless fiery torture in, the, in that place of flames called hell? No, said the Pope. Hell, he announced, does not exist as a place, but is a situation in which one finds oneself after freely and definitely withdrawing from God, the source of life and joy. Life is not a system of reward and punishment, and no one is sent to hell or condemned by God. The Pope said people must be very careful in interpreting biblical descriptions of hell, the inextinguishable fire and the burning oven, which he said are symbolic and metaphorical. These picture phrases are meant to indicate the complete frustration and vacuity of a life without God, John Paul said. So what is the truth? Are any human beings in hell? That is, John Paul II said, not something we can know. This is a remarkable statement from a spiritual leader of one of the largest religious organizations in the world. Asked that question 10 years ago, there were very few priests, ministers, rabbis, or mohas on the planet who would have responded with anything other than an immediate and unequivocal yes. What do you think we've been trying to tell you? But the Pope has apparently some new ideas on this subject that are very much in concert with the new cultural story, because they eliminate the fear of hell as a theological tool with which to construct an entire physical, spiritual reality that has deeply affected humanity. One result of this new teaching, people's concept of life will no longer be shaped by a win-lose construction of the afterlife. They'll begin to formulate new ideas of what is experienced after death, Humans will then no longer structure their lives around the hope of getting to heaven and the fear of going to hell. They'll stop doing extraordinary, shocking, and self-destructive things to produce the first outcome. They'll find different reasons to act as they act, choose what they choose, say what they say, and think what they think. They'll create that new measure of morality for which the world has been seeking, searching. Regarding life, humans will understand that life is not a school, neither is it a time of testing. If God wants nothing, there is no reason for a test. If humans are one with God, there is nothing to learn. There is only to remember what has been forgotten. Humans will also understand that life is not an ordeal during which the soul struggles to get back to God, but rather is an ongoing process by which the soul seeks to know God, then to grow, to expand and to experience more of what it is. It will also be clear what this process called evolution never ends, but is experienced by the soul everlastingly at different levels and in different life forms. Humans will also understand that life is not limited to what can be perceived by the, seven, by the five senses, but is far wider in scope and deeper in dimension than humans at first imagined or have been told by religion. One result of this teaching, more attention will be paid to what is not perceived by the five senses. And this will be the basis of a new understanding of life and how it might joyfully and wondrously be experienced. Life will not be lived with an eye toward the afterlife, but with an eye towards what is being created, expressed, and experienced at many levels of the perception in the holy moment of now. Humans will become increasingly aware that now is the only time there is. Life will not be experienced as a struggle or as an effort to get back home to God, but rather as a free-flowing expression of one's intrinsic nature, which is 
unlimited and divine. Getting to heaven will no longer be the ultimate purpose in life. Creating heaven wherever you are will be seen as the prime objective. To experience this, people will not have to confess any sins or fast during daylight hours or travel on pilgrimages or go to places of worship weekly or tithe regularly or perform any particular ritual or act. Although they may choose to do any of these things if it pleases them or helps to remind them of who they are in relationship to God or assists them in staying connected with their purpose. Because of their deeper understanding and rich personal experience of life as a unified field, for people everywhere, life itself will become the prime value and the core around which all spiritual understanding and expression revolves. Regarding gender, humans will understand that God is not male, nor is God female, but that God has no gender at all. Because the idea of God as a male being will be rejected as simplistic and inaccurate. Humans will also understand that men are not superior to women in any way. The thought that God wants men and women to have limited roles in life will be abandoned in favor of a thought of complete equality for men and women. Indeed, with regard to all people everywhere of whatever race, creed, gender, age, or sexual persuasion, the lack of superiority and the absolute equality of individuals will be the only thought there is. One result of this teaching, discrimination and abuse of females will disappear from civil society. Regarding marriage, humans will understand marriage to be a spiritual tool, a sacred device used by evolving beings to play out their soul's agenda and to complete that part of their journey, which involves mutuality with a particular other for the purpose of growth and the continued recreation, recreation of self. They'll also understand that all human relationships are hollowed ground that intimate relationships with a significant other are highly impactful and important, and that holy matrimony is a contract of extraordinary meaning and consequence. Humans will be aware that no two souls meet by chance, but that every human encounter is purposeful and laden with gifts, and that every melding of hearts and partnership of souls, however long or brief, is the playing out of a mystical agreement, God's invitation to experience and expand in awareness, consciousness, understanding, and expression of divine essence of being. One result of this teaching, people will not see marriage as an opportunity to complete themselves or to somehow bring to their lives something that is missing but to celebrate the fact that there is nothing missing, that they are whole, complete, and perfect, just as they are, and to expand and grow in their experience of this through the wondrous miracle of bonded relationship. Humans will never again enter into or stray in marriages for reasons of security, because they'll understand that the only real security is not in owning or possessing, nor in being owned or possessed, not in demanding or expecting, and not even in hoping that what they think they need in life will be supplied by another, but rather in knowing that everything they desire in life, all the love, all the passion, all the wisdom, all the insight, all the power, all the knowledge, all the understanding, all the nurturing, all the compassion, and all the strength resides within them. Humans will see marriage as a truly holy communion, a a union between two loving people lasting as long as both choose to be united, 
not a union that is required by God to be everlasting, for better or for worse. Humans will understand that the success of a marriage is measured by what has been given and received, understood and remembered, shared and healed, and by what growth has been produced. And finally, all humans will understand that marriage is about teamwork, the teamwork of two souls, to have created a holy team to do the holy work of life itself, which is the work of growth and the expression of divinity through the experience of unity. Those who have a truly holy union will know that their union is a three-way union, that their team consists of each other and of God, and that this is the only team there is. Regarding sex and sexuality, humans will understand that sexual union is a glorious and wonderful expression of the oneness of being, an extraordinarily powerful and deeply meaningful experience of the most intimate physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of the self that two people can share, a celebration of love and life that has no equal in physical form. They'll also see clearly that sex is not laden with any taboos, do's or don'ts, but is meant to be experienced joyfully by two consenting adults in whatever way pleasure brings pleasure and respects the boundaries, desires, and agreements of both. Humans will also understand that the human body is sacred, not embarrassing, and that no part of the body is anything other than totally beautiful and may therefore be shown and seen without shame. One result of this teaching, sexual guilt and sexual shame will virtually disappear from the human family. So will sexual assault. Sexual expression will be lifted to the level of the profound, never lowered to the level of the profane. And there will be no thought that spiritual energy and sexual energy do not mix, but rather it will be taught that sexual energy is a beautiful expression of spiritual energy in physical form. Many more people will become familiar with tantric sex, in which the sexual experience is expressed as a sacred union. Tantra is defined as the realization of the oneness of the self and the visible world. And when sex is experienced as sacred, it is in physical form the only tantra there is. Regarding homosexuality, humans will understand that there is no form and no matter in which the expression of a love that is pure and true is inappropriate. One result of this teaching Humans for whom same-gender sexual attraction feels most natural will no longer be denounced, vilified, condemned, ostracized, isolated, assaulted, and killed by people who believe they are doing God's will. Their wholesale discrimination and oppression will end. Regarding love. Humans will understand that love is neither quantifiable nor conditional. They'll know that the term conditional love is an oxymoron, that love cannot be parceled out in units of varying size, but is either present or not present in any given moment and with any given person as an experience of the whole heart and mind and soul a full expression of the blessed essence of being itself. No two souls meet by chance. While humans will understand that love cannot be quantified, they'll see that it can be expressed in different ways and that these different kinds of love 
are what they confused with different levels of love in the past. Hang on a second. Because it will be clear that God wants nothing from human beings and gives everything to human beings, God will be the ultimate model at last of what love is and means. One result of this teaching, the veil of confusion around love will lift at last. Humans will use the term love to mean an entirely different thing than it now means in most human relationships. It will never again be confused or used interchangeably with the word need. There is no form and no manner in which the expression of a love that is pure and true is inappropriate. The term love will be deeply respected as it will be clear that it carries actual energy as do all words, but this one to a very high degree, and produces a more different and powerful vibration than perhaps any other term in humanity's many languages, except the various names of deity. Indeed, it will be very clear that there is no universal term common to all languages that comes closer to capturing the very essence of God humans will see clearly that to define God in one word, love is the only term there is. Regarding money, humans will understand that money is simply energy taking a particular form and that like any other energy, it has neutral value in and of itself. They will also understand that money and wealth do not equal each other in absolute terms and that true wealth has nothing to do at all with money. Finally, humans will understand that God has nothing against money and that the idea that money and spirituality do not mix is false. One result of this teaching, wealth will be redefined with enormous consequences for society. What humans strive for, what humans work for, will have nothing to do with the accumulation of money, but rather the accumulation of value within their lives, for their families, and for humanity as a whole. Money will be seen as nothing more than a tool, one of many that may be used in the creation of mutual value. The redefining of wealth will also produce a new kind of currency. Equal exchange credits, EVEX, will be a new currency denomination and will take the form of any exchange, not merely the exchange of paper or coins or financial accounting credits, which brings equal value to both sides in the transaction. Because the idea that money is bad and that money and spirituality do not mix will be dropped, humans will be freed of the feeling of guilt having around having money, making it possible for persons who do good things for the world, even for those who do God's work, to earn more than the modest amounts of money without being made wrong. it will become clear that for society to become maximally functional, the highest honor might most beneficially be given to persons bringing to society what society itself says its values most. Now, as before, a bit of the abstract. Again, let's explore some topics that may be a bit more abstract but that are no less a part of the human experience. And let's see what the new cultural story will put into our reality if the vision laid out in this conversation comes true. Regarding free will, humans will understand that their their will is truly free. 
they'll know that God will never cause them to suffer dire consequences in the afterlife for making one choice over another in life. One result of this teaching, contradictions will be taken out of God's promise to humans, and this will inspire humans to remove the contradictions from their own promises to each other. A new definition of freedom will be created, one that reflects what the world word has always intended to mean, the complete and total lack of limitations of any kind. Regarding suffering, humans will understand that God does not want anyone to suffer ever and certainly does not require any being to suffer needlessly or endlessly in order to stay in good standing with God or do what's right. One result of this teaching, if they have any control over the circumstances, People will no longer require themselves or others to endure ongoing physical pain needlessly or endlessly. People will also understand the difference between suffering and pain, observing that pain is an objective experience while suffering is a subjective decision about it. Many mothers experience the pain of childbirth not as suffering at all, but as an intense but joyous celebration of life itself, producing life itself through the process of life itself. Rising to this level of awareness about all pain is a matter of elevating one's consciousness and adopting a change of perspective, which can alter an entire experience. Thus, consciousness is used as a transformative tool creating in the human mind an experience of the body that defies exterior evidence and transmutes it. Regarding morality, humans will understand that morality is not unchanging, nor is it dictated by God's desire, since God wants nothing at all. One result of this teaching people will begin to take the question of defining morality firmly into their hands, refusing to cede authority to any organization or institution. The outcome of this will be that contemporary morals will be more authentic, will more authentically reflect contemporary behaviors. Humans will thus be able to act the way they have routinely acted not only doing so without guilt or fear of being judged, outed, or condemned. The argument that humanity's values will drop should this occur will not be validated because people given higher levels of responsibility for themselves will be found to rise to higher levels of greatness in the creation and expression of who they are. This is the purpose and the wonder of life they'll see to constantly recreate myself anew in the next grandest vision of the greatest ver- I'm sorry, version. Okay, let me do it again. To constantly recreate myself anew in the next grandest version of the greatest vision I ever held about who we are as a species, as individuals, and as divine beings in a, ca- in a causal universe. Regarding death, humans will understand that death does not exist. The will, the, the will, now there's a typo here. They will know that our opportunity to learn and grow is never over and that the time to be rewarded or punished for how we lived our lives will never come because life is not a reward and punishment proposition, but rather a process of ending growth, expansion, self-expression, self-creation, and self-fulfillment. Death will be understood to be simply and only a transition 
a glorious shifting in the experience of the soul, a change in our level of consciousness, a freedom-giving, pain-releasing, awareness-expanding breakthrough in the eternal process of evolution. One result of this teaching, many humans will know that death is not something to be feared, but a wonderful part of the wonderful experience called life itself. People will talk about death freely and without undue sadness. People will not feel compelled to cling to life when they are suffering and dying because they'll know that there is nothing but life. And so there is no reason to cling to the only thing there is. Death is not something to be feared, but a wonderful part of the wonderful experience of life itself. Endless suffering at the conclusion of one's time in particular, physical form will no longer be demanded or required as a matter of spiritual integrity any more than it's required of other life forms. This does not mean that ending one's own life as a means of escape from particular difficulties or sadness will be encouraged. It will be understood that life in one's present physical form is a wondrous gift, and no one will ever wish to toss it away in order to sidestep the challenges, but will understand at the deepest level that it may be used in order to experience who we really are. And in this, and in many other ways, personal lives will be remarkably different when humans create a new cultural story. With apologies and an honoring of John Lennon, imagine personal relationships with all others that are no longer need-based, but emerge more profoundly from an experience of personal fulfillment, personal power, and the personal expression of the highest thought about yourself and others that resides within everyone. Imagine romance that exudes not from the thought that you can't live without someone, but from the awareness that the expression and experience of your fullest and highest and grandest self is not dependent on any other person, but enriches every person whose life you touch immensely allowing you to truly love from a place of giving. Imagine a career and work that feels more like joy and the celebration of the highest and best within you and the happiest experience of who you are. Imagine a life without fear of God and without guilt over the tiniest infraction of what you imagine to be God's rules. Imagine the freedom of soul and mind and body that would be experienced when you understand at last that you really are one with God. Imagine the power that you would experience, the power to create the life of your dreams and to assist others in creating theirs. Imagine the end to frustrations and anxieties and worries about tomorrow, to say nothing of the sadness and bad feelings that can't seem to be shaken about things that happened yesterday, when you realize that nothing can go wrong, that all things are perfect just as they are, that God does not require anything different from you except exactly what you are being, exactly what you are doing, and exactly what you are having right now. Finally, imagine experiencing the awe and wonder of life expressing through you as you in your day-to-day moments because of your wondrously expanded awareness. This is just a taste of what life could be like in the days of the new cultural story. And you don't have to wait for all of humanity to create that experience collectively. All people can begin to create it individually for themselves and in the lives of those they touch. That is, in fact, what life invites you to do. It's what God is calling you to do right now. You may begin this minute. Points I hope you'll remember. 
the time for courage has really come. Oneness is the basis of our new cultural story. There is nothing that is not part of the one thing that is. There is no form and no manner in which the expression of love that is pure and true is inappropriate. God does not want anyone to suffer ever. Death does not exist. Actions I hope you will take. Share the ideas you see here about life, how life could be if humanity only embraced a new cultural story. Add to these ideas yourself by contributing your inspirations at www.theglobalconversation.com. Read my previous book, What God Wants, 2005, a try of books, and in which many of these ideas appeared. This book should be on your must-read list, and it's highly recommended by me as the one book I would give first to anyone who asks about the Conversations with God material and may want to know more about it. No human beings need ever be afraid of God again. Thank you, Linda. I uh, actually have a a lot to say about this chapter, uh, but do know that the www.theglobalconversation.com no longer is active because I'm the one that built that site and and there wasn't much interest in it so it's just you could probably still get there but it's not current at all so know that you know if you'd like to write to somebody who doesn't want to <laughs> you don't want a response <laughs> go right ahead anyway thank you linda um Within the next like five minutes, does anybody want to anything that jumped out at them? Say something about something that might have jumped out to them. I think um, he... I just go ahead, Shimona. No, no, I'm done. You go ahead. Uh, my only comment is that I think that uh, it's important to recognize that the current pope has now come out and said that there is no way to justify war anymore. So early on in this chapter, when he was talking about the Pope um, and what John Paul had said, so now the next Pope, or not the next one in secession, but the current Pope has now come out with another just as radical statement, if not maybe more radical. Agreed. Over. Also, in that same encyclical, the current, I mean, there's a lot in there. And one of the things is the whole thing is about, like, brotherhood. I mean, I don't necessarily like that language, but the idea that your neighbor isn't just your neighbor, it's everyone. You know, we're all sort of brothers and sisters in this together, um, which right there, that's the oneness thing. And I, I don't know that that's ever, it goes with the no war thing but it's just a radical reframing, you know? Thank you, over. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Linda, were you going to say something? Uh, no, I did pull up that website. Um, and the website's still live, and that's where you can find the uh, the uh, free version of the book we're reading right now. Right, but it's not up to date, is what I'm saying. Nobody yeah. is nobody's answering any but any thing or commenting right. on anything. Um, I'm kind of surprised it's still there because um, whatever platform like GoDaddy or whatever. It hasn't been paid in three years, so I'm surprised it's still there. But um, well, somebody's updating it because it's down at the bottom. It says 2008 to 2020. So it's somebody's updating at least that much of it at the footer. <laughs> Sorry, uh, 
That makes me laugh. I can't yeah. imagine who that would be unless it would be Neil. Um, because he and I are the only ones that would do that. But um, Can I say something, Bob Larry? Thank you. I'm sorry I get here so late all the time. I'm glad I could get on today. Um, the, the issue of uh, eternal life, we can live through our children and people we touch spiritually also, can't we? And I'm glad that uh, you brought up the Pope, but uh, we need a more liberalization of, and compassion. It's less uh, uh, hell and brimstone, I think, is the, the word that puts so much fear and hate in people. He just came out for uh, accepting LGBT, I believe, also. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that's what you're saying, but it is sad that, uh, and of a lot of our politics also, I believe, comes from our, that uh, religious hostility, conservative hostility, and uh, towards government, towards each other, and, and more, it's, it's not a very, you say Christ-like and compassion, the Christians, it's uh, not very compassionate. Um, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, and more compassion, less hell and brimstone, less hostility and hate. Yep. And one of the things we're going to do is um, we're going to be reading the recent encyclical once we're finished with this book um, because it was so open-minded and so what we needed to hear from somebody and it happened to be um pope francis so we'll keep everybody posted on that um we've only got four minutes so i'm going to have shabana do the meditation and do remember that uh shabana gives us a moment to be silent during or afterwards. Thank you, Shabana. Go ahead. You're welcome. Lord God, thank you for this chapter because it summarizes all that we have been learning in this book club. All the books are summarized right here, right now. And we thank you that Robert and Linda and Mary have spoken about the change in the views and attitudes of the current Pope. No one now accepts anything other than oneness and we're joining our hearts here now to celebrate the opportunity to pool our intention and our energy in uplifting all of humanity by giving thanks that we are indeed one and that absolutely everyone is equal and equally worthy of love and respect. Amen. Okay, everyone, let's go do a happy dance. Happy dance, happy dance. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Linda, as usual. And see you, Shabana, Mary, and Dima, and Robert, and Linda, and me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> don't forget you, you Nanette. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Nanette. I love you, you guys. Back in there. All I right. Love you all. All right. Happy. Everybody be good this week. It's going to be rough. Yeah, it's oh, going to be a wild one. Especially need, you, Linda. We need, we need God's help. <laughs> yep. All right. For a more peaceful spirit. That's right. <laughs> On earth. Okay. Man, it's beyond. Love Amen. you guys. One day. One day. One day. Okay. Thank okay. you all. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.